And our keynote speaker has stretched our minds to think very deeply about certain things. Biodiversity, they say, is the strongest defense that we have against climate change. And we must evolve and transition from where we are to cleaner energy. Yet, as he said, the impact on our nascent energy sector will be enormous. This is the sector, oil and gas, that has contributed as much as 4.5% of our GDP, 2013-2021. Our gas demand, domestic alone, as we understand very recently, has been about 85%. So how do we transition from something that is becoming the live wire of our economy, and yet we must transition. Please, during the question and answer time, you can ask him some of your questions. Of course, the Minister for Energy himself, blunt speaking as he did, ask him some of the questions as well. At this time, we would like to bring on Mr. Benjamin Boachi, who is the Executive Director of Africa Center for Energy Policy, for a very brief discussion. He will share his thought also on what the University of Ghana at its 75th anniversary is forcing the country to think about. And then we will have you join the discussion. So, uh, Mr. Boache is joining us by Zoom. Mr. Boache, if you are ready and you are with us, good afternoon and thank you very much for joining this lecture. Uh, good afternoon, Samson, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Right, thank you very much. Um, Honorable Minister, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one of my favorites uh, in this industry. Uh, distinguished personalities uh, present in the Great Hall. In the interest of time, I just want to acknowledge the presence of every distinguished individual uh, watching us online or present at the auditorium. Um, I don't want to thank the university for this honor uh, to be part of this great uh, conversation. And I would want to say that as an alumni of the university, we owe it a duty uh, to respond to calls for this nature. Unfortunately, I was not able to be there in person, uh, but technology allows us to still engage uh, on this issue. Um, we have a duty uh, to remain uh, the nation's hope and glory. And I'm happy that it didn't have to come from me, but from the Honorable Minister, that we are the home to invest in and we have to guard and protect uh, I want to thank uh, my fellow panel, um, uh, Mr. Faber, for uh, giving us such an insightful uh, issues to think through, and also telling us where we've come from, uh, you know, as a country, before we discovered oil and commercial countries, and what we have been done uh, post that. I share in many of the thoughts that he has presented, and perhaps I'll proceed to add on and also uh, drill deeper to some of the issues that he has uh, actually discussed. Um, I have been following this industry even before I joined mainstream advocacy uh, with ASAP, you know, from school, uh, because I did my master's on uh, energy studies, specialized in oil and gas management. And most of the research questions at the time was about how Ghana can avoid uh, the resource gaps, even before oil was produced. And I think much of those questions and engagement with government and stakeholders led to the revolution and the establishment of the many institutions that um, Mr. David talked about, um, establishing one of the robust laws in revenue management, for the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, uh, establishing the Petroleum Commission, and moving on finally to 
you know, pass the EMP law, uh, which is supposed to guide an improved uh, contract regime uh, for Ghana. So in that space of time, and you look at the research questions and the optimism from our leaders at the time, you ask yourself, are we on track, you know, as the country for optimizing uh, the oil resources that we are blessed with? This same question was posed to the uh, former president before, as to whether Uganda was going to be able to pull through uh, as a shining example uh, for others to follow, for the rest of the continent to follow. And he was extremely optimistic by saying, I quote, that some countries are doing well. I assure you, if others fail, Ghana will succeed, because this is our destiny, to set a good pace for where we are. So we are going to use it well, he said. So um, we can ask ourselves, and I have not answered it now, whether we have actually used uh, uh, the resources well, or we are actually doing well, as uh, you know, the president was hopeful that we could do with our oil resources. If you look at how the legal framework is for, particularly the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, even though it focuses on revenue, it also addresses significant governance challenges across the industry. And at the time, we were learning from many other countries, uh, mainly uh, Norway. Uh, the country decided that we didn't want strictly the Norwegian example, or go the you know, Nigerian or Angolan example where the national oil companies had abused uh, revenues and resources in the sector. What we chose was a model that actually ensured that there was greater accountability and transparency across the entire value chain. So what we decided to do was that even though we were hoping to build a national oil company, we wanted all the revenues, including the money that would be spent by the national oil company to come into a central pool so that parliament can see how revenues are spent the public can engage on that expenditure, and periodic reports will be generated. So if you check the law, the law requires that there is a public interest and accountability committee that issues report on the expenditure of the revenues, including what goes into the national oil, uh, to the national oil company, and projects that are actually funded uh, through uh, oil revenue. So that's how robust and accountable we wanted uh, uh, the system to be, so we can avoid the pitfalls that other uh, countries have, you know, uh, gone through. But we passed that law 2011. Shortly after that, politicians realized that GNPC was too restricted, and that they did not have the usual manual or rule to spend outside the control of parliament and other accountability mechanisms. So they decided that they would set up what they call a commercial entity uh, to manage the commercial activities of petroleum, uh, uh, of GMs, which they call the Explo is still around. Essentially, what Explo was established to do is what the mandate of the National Oil Company is, to be the commercial player, the commercial arm of government in petroleum activities. GMPC has a role to be a commercial entity and produce oil and energy. So that parallel entity was essentially to deviate or move away from the established protocols in the law so that you can now have an entity that is assigned uh, resources and then essentially manage outside the framework of the PR. And we tried, uh, I mean the new government at one point did not share in that vision and decided to, uh, uh, you know, clip the wings of Expo a little bit to still focus on GMPs. But suddenly a new trend has emerged, where now it's not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, Expo, but many other uh, 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 subsidiaries are emerging to do the same activities that GMPC is supposed to be doing. And the recent one in contention is the uh, uh, Jubilee Oil Hole, which now not even established to uh, 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 be in our shops, but sits offshore. So the oil that we are producing in 
Takrade uh, area is now controlled by a company domiciled in the Cayman Islands. So I remember those days when we were writing and examining how we were using federal revenues around 2014. The conclusion that ASEP came to was that we have set up all the transparency mechanisms, but that transparency was without accountability. But looking back today, we are treading into an arena where even transparency is becoming a rarest commodity in the oil and gas industry. And we have to really watch it to ensure that we can have that industry that is still accountable and transparent. Um, we need investment, and I was glad that you know, uh, the speaker talked about the need for us to re-examine the model that we are operating. See whether we still have to share the risk or go the sole trajectory where we are empowering the state entities and giving them money uh, to be able to do exploration on their own. I am still for the shared risk model. And I think that even with energy transition, the risks are heightened for us not to continue to risk uh, uh, revenues that could go into direct intervention uh, for the people of Ghana. And the lessons are clear for us to, to, to learn from. If you look at since we passed the PRMA and uh, started producing oil, we have so far given GMPC about $1.1 billion. And that is not money for is participation in the field. Those are their level B expenditures that they are supposed to use to be able to build the capacity that we invest for them to be able to produce the oil. And over that period, one billion, one point one billion dollars, they have not drilled one well from that. And you look at the companies that came into Ghana, Cosmos, Talo, Anadako, even ENI that is a bigger company, none of them carried even half, half a billion to come to Ghana to do the exploration for which we are producing oil. So clearly tells you that the trajectory of thinking that we can hand money to state agencies for them to exploit resources and generate return is only a mirage. And we have to really re-examine the trade off of not investing that one billion in education, health, agriculture, any other social investment cannot be examined in this short period of time. And I think we really have to look at it and make sure that we are sharing the risk and building institutions that are much more accountable. Assessing data and information today is becoming increasingly a challenge. And we keep talking about why we are not exploring as much as we should and why oil production is already declining uh, in our country. For three years on a row, we have moved from about 70 million dollar barrels uh, of production a day to about 50 uh, million barrels. That is a significant decline, which also brings into focus how we can amend that or change our ways to be able uh, to ramp up production and bring new fields uh, 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 into production. And I'm happy that um, uh, you know the commission says that they are now have granted approvals and appraisals have been done for uh, these new fields to come uh, uh, into production. And that again calls for us to re examine uh, some of the processes and protocols around approval. If you are not clear or you don't have time for approving uh, 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 your, you know, your contracts and approving all permits that are required. It rather frustrates investors. And investors increasingly get less interest uh, in your terrain. And I think we have to really look at that and ensure that we can incentivize people by approving some of these requests on time. And I will say that when the Block 4 you know, uh, appraisal request was presented uh, uh, last year, at the same time, that's about three months after we discovered ours. Cote d'Ivoire also discovered oil. And within that space of time, we are going to produce the oil export. And we are still looking at appraising uh, our discoveries. 
that shows the time lag uh, that we need, we, we have, you know, in approving some of these uh, 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 permits and authorizations for uh, the uh, 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 production processes to actually start. Right, but briefly, um, I'm I'm seeking to cut you at this point. Uh, if you can end in a minute, then we'll come to you with follow-up questioning because you're stirring up some controversy. And uh, our keynote speaker and our, our guest of honor will have to respond to some of the issues that you raise. And please also get ready to ask your questions. You can pose your questions to any of our guests uh, here in front. Yes, Ben. Right. Okay. So, in, in just summarizing, I mean, we're talking about energy transition, and I had the concern of the honourable minister that we need to raise money from the resources that we do have and be able to uh, advance the development uh, 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 that we engage. But the fundamental question also is, how do you do that when, you know, the terrain, the, the, the licensing regime is being questioned consistently by the investors and people who are interested in our terrain? Because um, we did a licensing round way back in 20. 18 and concluded in 2019. As we speak, companies that won the bid have still not had the right to go to site to go and start performing their function. At the same time, we have done all the roadshows and we are not bringing the investors. But the investors who are already here cannot get those permits to be able to advance the work uh, that they are doing. So, again, it comes back to how we take advantage of the window opportunity that we do have before the transition kicks in aggressively. I also want to end in this note that when governments, politicians meet to discuss whether oil should be produced or not produced, there are other groups who are often not in the room but are very important in shaping the, the future of energy in our world. People are advancing technology and chasing to be the market of the next technology uh, for, uh, for energy. And that is something that we really have to pay attention to. We may be granted permission, clearance to go on to produce our energy or our oil and gas. But if there is an option tomorrow through the research and development that is happening, regardless of how much oil we have, it will still not make any change in the trajectory that the world uh, is going. So, with the opportunity for us to comment, and still submit input into the National Transition Plan, uh, we will welcome that and be able to aggressively look at the opportunities that the transition also presents and how Ghana uh, can begin to look at those opportunities and not think that it's all uh, doomed uh, uh, because oil may not be needed uh, uh, tomorrow. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ben, for you, when you look at the uh, framework the energy transition framework. There are clear timelines and it seeks to ensure that we attain carbon neutrality within a secure uh, environment. What is it within the framework that needs fundamentally to change to be able to achieve what we seek? Because you seem to suggest that it is not implementable at present. No, I think it's implementable. I think, um, I mean, I've been in this space and realized that documents themselves don't mean much. It's really the action that I've taken subsequent to that. This is a broad framework which can still be distilled to actually go granular and add things that are new and things that are emerging at any particular time. Time. What we really need is to open up that conversation and how we implement uh, the document and make it a living document that evolves and adaptable uh, to the changing trends uh, of our time. Uh, and that is where we have failed consistently over time. I remember our first intervention uh, when the, the, the plan was commissioned or the activity to draft the plan was launched. It was for us to review most of the documents that speak the same thing and why we have failed consistently to implement them so that they guide how we change 
figures for us to be able to deliver uh, on this energy transition plan. If you ask me, what I think is that Ghana has many other opportunities beyond oil and gas uh, that we can on the back of energy transition also optimize. So our fear of losing oil revenue shouldn't kill the prospects of developing our mineral resources that could be aligned uh, to the energy transition or empowering our agricultural industry to produce uh, the next generation of resources or energy that we need uh, to be able to meet the needs. When COVID struck, not many countries expected that Brazil and the United States would be selling billions of dollars of ethanol uh, uh, on the back of you know, agriculture that they have improved over time. But suddenly, they have opportunity to sell to the world uh, what was necessary and what was needed. We are still today importing ethanol when we have capacity to produce and export. That could be far more important than the $8 billion that we have got mm. uh, over a 12-year period. Right. That creates more jobs than what we have seen the oil industry give us. Mm. So we have to open up to the opportunities whilst we take advantage of the window that is left for us to produce the oil that we do now. By the framework, we are seeking to leverage on the resources that we get from oil to be able to get net zero target 2020, 2050, more than 50% of water heating systems to be solar heaters, more than 50% of metro urban households to use electric stoves, more than 90% of households household electrical appliances to be best in class and more than 70 percent of road vehicles to be electricity and hydrogen fueled what do you say about this plan brilliant i mean we can achieve all of that right you can get everybody using electric stove you can get everybody riding electric vehicle. but the question is how do you and how do you benefit from that value chain? Are you going to import all the batteries uh, to uh, uh, you know, power the electric vehicles? Are you going to buy all the stores uh, from China uh, uh, for people to use? Or you are setting up a system working with academia and research institutions to be able to start producing some of these um, items uh, domestically? Are we going to reduce it to standard money so that energy commission wants this? Uh, what air condition is coming in and they put their logo or sticker uh, to say that this is energy efficient or we are aiming at you know a, a turn around where our, our research institutions will be part of uh, you know developing the next generation of technologies that optimizes uh, uh, you know clean cooking and the rest of it so that is a conversation that could be bought to right on the so to get so the those are good questions you ask since we have the minister here with us and we also have the CEO of the Petroleum Commission right here. I suppose they will have answers for and all of us. So who would like to answer his question? And please, uh, there's a microphone that is coming to you. It's at the very extreme at the back there. You put your hand up. You give us your question in 30 seconds if you can. But please hold on. Before we come for your questions, let's answer Ben's questions. Thank you. Um, I'll first say that the document, the National Transition, Energy Transition Framework document, must be read. Uh, this is not a document that has been hurried. And this is not a document that has been done without the reality. We have a lot of policies. We've translated most of the policies into law. We have amended some of the laws because of current happenings. We needed a framework to ensure the fuels we use in generating the energy we need are clean or renewable fuels. That is what this document intends to do. We are also cognizant of the fact that nearly over 60% of our energy use is probably fuel wood. Another aspect of energy transition 
is to ensure that we don't deplete our forest and cause deforestation or, 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 or the savannah encroaching. Another thing we have to think about is the cost of the energy in adopting these technologies, whether they are affordable or not. So the Transition Framework document examines everything and defines a pathway out of the many pathways possible that Ghana can evolve through. I would say, uh, let us read the document and come out with reasoned criticisms of the document. Because we are not afraid it subjected our document to discussions and dialogue. Because knowledge does not reside in the head of Matthew Poku Prempe or for that matter alone. That is why we took the position that we consulted every part of the society, not the so-called experts alone. Not the so-called experts. We had fora with the judiciary. Because sometimes, even in interpreting our laws for those who fall short, is hampered by the knowledge of the judicial people. Parliament in formulating the laws, might not be aware of certain things, current or future coming, that they have to plan. So if you look, they gathered all available policies and regulations and documents and laws available, reviewed them in the context of where we are headed. If you look at the definition of energy transition, it's to change and transform our fuel use from carbon to net zero, which may include nuclear. When you look into our domain, Ghana has gone the nuclear path. Now we have established nuclear power Ghana, gone through the IAEA system of adopting nuclear energy. And we are now even encouraging vendor countries to come. We've developed a site. We are looking at whether we partner a country with small modular reactors or with a large nuclear. It's a process that started from President Kofo setting the Ajay Bekwe Commission till Nanado set up the nuclear propaganda, going around with the nuclear policies and things like that. So this document with framework, we are even subjecting it to international scrutiny. As we speak, we are working with the UN agency, Sustainable Energy for All, the UN body. That took our document, that has partnered Ghana in even planning a roadshow to raise funds to enable us to go on. When you come to the ministry, when you come to renewable, like wind, you just don't say we are doing renewable, so we are going to deploy wind. There has to be studies in those areas in Ghana where we have the wind of a certain speed and a certain regularity and see how much available space there is to not affect other civilian uses of that wind. Ghana is limited. Even when you come to renewable energy, would we cut forests to bring our high, uh, large utility farms? Would you do that? And then you get into that part of the country that we can deploy large amount of utility nuclear. Then you ask yourself, how do you transport even the energy, evacuate the energy? So we go through all that in the ministry before we come up with a document. That's why we have the regulatory agencies. We have Energy Commission, we have ERC, we have Petroleum Commission, we have um, NPA, we have all them, and everybody looks at certain aspects before. Because the citizen, no matter you can provide the facility, it also has to be affordable. Or the people cutting down the trees will not stop cutting down the trees. When you are bringing an EV car, electric vehicle, into the system, you have to look at the duties. Whether you, are, you did take a position that for the first five years, for ad adoption purposes, it should be zero rated. And when we get to a certain level, when we are buying mass public vehicles, where do we stay now? Go to gas or hydrogen. And when you look in the trans National Energy Transition Frame document, you have abandoned. That's why you are reciting that. In this recital, we have partnered a country like Saudi Arabia. That has a lot of money that wants to do some of these things with developing countries. We've partnered companies in South Africa that are going to share some of the clean cooking stoves and things, about one million. So, if you don't read and interact like such a forum with the ministry, you think nothing is being done. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'll take a minute's response from Egbert Fable before we come down to take the questions from there. Um, so as a regulator, from what I hear Dr. Machio Puku Prempe suggests, it does appear that there are clear pathways, there are uh, processes ongoing to ensure that we implement the framework and achieve the timelines we set for ourselves. So we know we live in a country where, for example, development, as in real estate, is haphazard, very much uncontrolled. So how, for example, is government going to ensure that water heating systems are solar 50% by 2050? Is it by way of some incentives? Is it by way of ensuring that regulation requires it? Please, there's a microphone by you. Hello? Yeah, thank you very much, Samson. I think the Energy Commission, if you look at the distribution and certification for electricity, the Energy Commission is better suited to speak to this. But, but from what I know, the plan that the president launched, or the framework that the president launched in Sharm El Sheikh, you know, it's a very detailed one, and as the minister said, a lot of work is being done. We just have to insist. I mean, if the assemblies are the ones that give building permits, it is within the remit of the assemblies to ensure that if we are doing receptacles for storage of renewable energy for deployment, so the minister and I were somewhere in... Um, Canada, I think I was with Honorable Mesa, and we we're looking at an institution that we've been training people at Nate, and we realized that look, there is a deficit of technicians, and if we are not careful, when energy transition comes full steam, we may have to go and bring expatriates to do technician roles for that, and so that's how come, for example, I was calling for this National Institute of Petroleum and Renewable Energy so that we can here in Ghana train and certify you know, in an applied manner are technicians, otherwise there will be a deficit. But, I mean, all agencies... Uh, sorry to cut in, the yeah. question is, are we doing that? Yeah. Yes. Because Ebert is a regulator for oil and gas, the regulator for energy commission is not here. Just in the last few months, 21 legislative instruments were passed, building up standards and labeling criteria for all the common usages we are talking about. So we are not going to allow you to say bring in a one-star air condition because it will cost you in operating the air condition more and, and be more carbon unfriendly to the environment. That has been achieved for the first time in this country in the last few months. Uh, Parliament by Kelsey passing the law. So a lot is being done. We have done something the Renewable Energy Act amendment said called net metering. Net metering, hopefully, is going to ensure that the ordinary housing association builders we are talking about will see the sense in deploying solar panels to feed electricity, air conditions. Now we have solar air conditions, solar heaters in houses. Because the more solar panels you put and power or energize your house, you can then sell the excess to the national grid. Hitherto, it was not available. These things were very expensive. Now, the prices have come rock bottom. So you have to bring in the incentives to encourage builders. And one of those such incentives is net metering. That PRC in the last uh, assessment, if you heard them, has come out with the guidelines for net metering. We are hoping that we'll move on. So we are not leaving any bits on tackle. The regulatory agencies, he himself, we are talking about green oil and gas production. And we have companies that decided that they are going to tallow is going to reforestation, working with the uh, uh, Forestry Commission to regenerate some of our forest. We have ENI thinking of going into uh, solar with with we down uh, we power authority and things. So a lot of this is being done. Just in the la president's last visit to Abu Dhabi, the probably the world's largest solar park uh, builder in the world, Mazda owned by Abu Dhabi, intends to come to Ghana and provide at least 500 megawatts of renewable solar plants. I'm working with Bui. Uh, 
So that is how we go. It. You tackle everything and then try and move everything off it. Thanks. <laughs> all right, all right, finish up. Because, um, and I'm holding you to a minute, please. Yeah, my friend Benjamin raised a number of issues that I think should. I mean, he talks about transparency and all those things. Yes, I mean, everybody's for transparency. Today, today, we have a petroleum register online where if you want to know who is in what petroleum agreement, or you do www.ghanapetroleumregister.org. And then you go and you see everything. So the Jubilee Holdings matter that he talked about, I think that the minister here should be applauded. Why did that come about in the first place? You are sitting down and a player, an adako in your industry says that it is selling its interest. And so as regulators, we saw it drew the ministry's attention. The ministry said, no, if that's the case, let's exercise GMPC's preemption rights for GMPC to buy in. And so GMPC bought him. But in the, in the space of doing the arrangements, the seller felt that I must get my money first. So let me bank my participating interest that I'm seeking to sell in an offshore place, on Ghana place, and then I transfer it to that. That is the arrangement. And I think that government and the Ministry of Petroleum Commission, GMP should be applauded for going to increase Ghana's equity in the prolific Jubilee Fields area. And then the, the time for appraisal. I don't know which appraisal program in Cote d'Ivoire can take three months. Appraiser, it, it entails drilling. Appraiser drilling, it takes between six months to about nine months to a year. For, and then the appraisal is done by the company. So when the company hasn't brought their appraisal for approval, what, what, what can you do? All right, thank you. Um, please now put your hand up if you have a question. Yes. And we will take about four in a row. So there are two here. Let's have the two people as they are questioning. There's one here. I can see one hand up here. Right. Please, your name quickly and your question within 30 seconds. Good evening. My name is Dr. Ramsey Inusa. Um, we all know that road transport is by far the dominant carrier of freight in Ghana's land transport system which amounts to 95%. However, the major factor to inflation is due to the surge of gasoline or diesel. Why aren't we investing a lot in LNG to power our transport system? Thank you. Thank you very much. The minister will answer your question. Yes, to the next questioner. At the back there. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Gideon Oforio Sabote, a climate policy expert. Thank you. I'm happy that at least we have um, a framework. But f listening to Honorable Minister, um, I, I don't know if this is, could be a gap that the public sometimes does not know what's going on. And so if that is a gap, do you have a public affairs directory that is constantly engaging the public or the citizenry to bring us on on because this is a transitionary phase let's not forget the cognitive aspect of the citizenry the collective cognitive aspect that we don't wake up at you know in a particular day and then we we are to move on to new systems how do we bring the, the public along as we implement or come up with all these frameworks thank you thank you yes here right here um as he comes around, I want to make good, good use of my time. Please, the question he asked. Ghana is one of the few countries in Africa that set up an LNG terminal together with Shell, uh, GMPC, to bring in LNG. What is LNG? It's liquefied natural gas. It's done so that you can transport bulk gas to distant places. But when you get to the place, you don't use the LNG. You regasify to be used in other sense. And just yesterday, the GMPC presented this promotion of work. And when you go through, you see that they are doing a Tema City Gate, where all our gas resources are going to pass through for regulatory and metering and then distribution. So a lot is being done. And that's one of the few countries that have got what we've got. So we are doing that. When my brother talks about public, in fact, in coming up with the energy transition document, 
no public engagement has been as extensive in this country as that, including all associations. I know you know that. But we don't stop there. Once we get the investor-friendly pack, which we are working on with SC for all, then we can go out and even do the second phase of the public advocacy as to the roles and the responsibilities. And it's not, not only even for the Ministry of Energy alone. Like I said, all other ministries must. It's a national document for participation by all. Um, sorry, but the question about the level of investment, are you able at this time to give us an idea in figures what is involved? Because his concern is more investment. More investment is other people becoming interested. You have to decide in Ghana how many LNG trains you can have. You can have only possibly about two. Tema and Takrade. I don't know where you're going to put the third one or something. And when you look at the record, Tema has been done. Then again, because of the Russia-Ukraine war, the private investor has decided that the price for which GMPC negotiated is no longer lucrative for him because the price has tripled. So he's taking his plant. You can't stop him from going to a more lucrative place. That's the business. When you say investor, 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 you hear the, uh, the chief executive talking about blocks that have been given as far back as 2014 to private citizens, not to state institutions. And they are even having the challenge of bringing in the investment. Not because our regulatory or fiscal terms is bad. Why would he and I be applying for even more blocks? But like he said, maybe the person who has come to acquire it was expecting money from somewhere and he hasn't gotten it. Maybe he was thinking he was going to partner somebody to come and operate it for them and he hasn't. So in the last year, We've cancelled four of such petroleum agreements. In fact, yesterday, I issued instructions to those who have been, after going through the auctioning of our blocks, they have decided after auction, when you go to an auction and you give a price for an item, after the bank, the gang is the, 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 the thing, buying is your money. Now, we are seeing that they are trying to renegotiate what they auctioned. And they come and they say, oh, we want that term. We want that what you gave something. You have to. Do. So Energy Petroleum Commission is coming up with templates, model petroleum agreements. I know that, that Ivory Coast has it, we don't. But for shallow water, for onshore, for deep, and for ultra deep. So that when you come, this is what we are offering. Maybe you can negotiate on the fiscal terms, but not on the T's and I's. Thank you very much. I suppose you've all been answered, and your question really about the publicity uh, of the framework, I think it's also very important. For example, we are looking to have rural households, 70% use LPG gas by, uh, is it 2070? So how much is the education going down? Let's take the next two questions. Yes, I can see. Yes. Thank you. My name is Kwame Jantua. I'm the chairman of the oil and gas sector, AGI, and a lawyer in the oil and gas sector. Mine is not a question. Mine is a comment, and mine is a futuristic comment with regards to probably having stranded assets and also being adored with lithium. We have uh, an oil hub that we are building up to make Ghana the center for oil. Shouldn't we be thinking, because I know some companies have started doing it, thinking of converting our oil into plastic granules, and those plastic granules are being made into panels for electric cars. I know ExxonMobil has started doing that. And we have lithium. So we can put that together so that as we go forward, we become a hub for this new electric cars that we're building. I think it's something we should start thinking of. Like we start, started thinking of nuclear, we're thinking of other things. I think it's time so that in future, we don't get stranded assets and we have 
additional use for our oil that would likely be stranded. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, according to the plan, all roads, all road and rail mobilities are to be electricity and hydrogen fueled by 2070. So how we get there? Yes, the next question. Yeah, my name is Bernard. I think uh, one of the things that uh, have happened across several countries is you have one regime that has a plan for uh, the transition and then when they leave power, another regime takes over and changes everything. So my question is how, how well is the framework secured uh, from now and for future? Thank you. Uh, ben, would you like to take that question Continuity, is it guaranteed? Uh, I think you can always not predict whether another government will continue uh, or not. We can keep reminding uh, the new government what they have to do, but we cannot guarantee. But I could respond to some of the things that I've said. This is not, this not about politics. Yeah. This, is, this is about what we need for the environment. And this program is mm -hmm. political, politics neutral. So what should be the difficulty if there is a change in the regime to continue to pursue the program? I think every government comes with its own program and policy. And that is something we have discussed over uh, the period, whether we should have a national plan that you know, political parties are enjoined to actually uh, deliver. If a government comes and decides that it wants another direction, uh, so be it. That's what they do all the time. And we can have a conversation with end up on how we deal with that. Um, uh, you know, much more aggressively to ensure that that continues. Uh, I mean, on the transition plan. I mean, you are I'm you are in the advocacy space. If yeah. there were to be a change of government and a government decides to abandon this plan, will you sit back and watch them abandon it? I think something in this space we can do all the talking that we want. Uh, there are people with money. We only advise. We only encourage. Uh, there are people with mandate, and they always need that mandate to do what they think uh, is right. And for good or wrong, that's what happens all the time. Um, but we need to have a position as a country how we address uh, that kind of lack of continuity uh, that we see uh, in policy. And you can talk about many uh, projects from the time that will never continue. Government after government, we don't have that, uh, uh, you know, to continue what the last government did and be able to finish that. So we can only hope that this will happen uh, when we make a change uh, in government and then we can be able to deal with it. But a quick response uh, to some of the things that uh, were said by the Honourable Minister and uh, Mr. Pitt. We have read it all, right? And as I indicated, I mean, if we really want to have a plan, a program that works, the consultation doesn't end about just calling people in the room and telling them what you want to do. You have to give opportunity, even when the draft document is ready, for people to go through the draft document. You say that you mean well. You want to have a, a framework, you want to have a plan. What do you think about this plan? And we have been in this policy space, receiving draft documents all the time <laughs> from ministries that are responsible uh, for the development of policies, from parliament to be able to contribute uh, to policy development, only to ensure that you know, the country uh, puts its best foot uh, forward. This never happened until the framework was planned, even though we're engaged to do some presentation uh, to us. And you can ask everybody in the civil society space. That's what really happened before this was ha uh, happening. I want to answer a question that was uh, put forward by uh, somebody uh, in the audience about uh, uh, LNG. Then what he was trying to say is that, why are we not thinking about deploying LNG for use in commercial vehicles, not the importation of LNG? And if we had had the opportunity to make inputs, into this document, we would have rather proposed that instead of opting for CNG in the document, we would have opted for a much more improved system in LNG deployment for transportation, which would have been much better than what we have uh, in that document. On the issue of ENI, I didn't say that it takes three months to do appraisal, which of course is possible. What I'm saying is that Every point discovered their oil. Three months after Ghana had discovered, uh, ENA had discovered its oil, 
And yet, they were able to go through all the approval processes because the system is set up clean for them to be able to do that and be able to produce the oil this quarter. The approval process for the minister to give the go-ahead took almost one year. And this is documented. And the companies are alive. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, you know, it, it cannot be done or it right. can be done. Okay. okay. Thank so you. On thank, thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. Wait when I give you the mic for a next question. Okay. Appraisal, approval process for appraisal lies with the recommendation from the Petroleum Commission. It's not the minister. So please get it right. But I want to just, just to add, when there is per the petroleum I mean, agreement, when there is a discovery, the contractor is allowed some time to go and do an evaluation as to whether or not the 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 discovery merits appraisal. So the burden is on the contractor in this instance, E and I. Now they do that, they are entitled to 120 days to come to that determination. So the company will use three months to make that determination and then come to the petroleum commission. And the same petroleum agreement says that thereafter they have between about 20, 24 or so months to do the appraisal program and bring. That is in the petroleum agreement. So that when this has been approved by parliament and all and the company is at appraisal stage and is going through the structures of what is the petroleum agreement the regulator or the ministry cannot go and behave like an octopus and say give right. me your appraisal program uh, you are delaying you want to produce so do thank it. you so i think that thank you mr fable and uh Mohammed amin Anta, the deputy minister wants to uh, make an intervention on the question of the lack of or not sufficient participation well thank you but be before that the issue about the bidding round the licensing round which was done by government and up till now we don't have companies uh given the right to do exploration i think we should understand that ghana is a sovereign country and therefore the ministry and the government must be protecting the interests of our country even with energy transition that has put pressure on us to fast track the development of our resources. That does not mean that government should allow the country to be shortchanged. And so you've done licensing rounds. The companies that were selected have come to make extra demands on the government. I don't think it's that because we want to do things quickly, we give in to those unrealistic demands made by those companies. That is not the way to develop our country and to protect the interests of our country. The second issue on participation, I think that all relevant stakeholders were consulted. Because I chaired the committee, including ASEP. And so I'm even surprised ASEP is asking how, 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 when they had an opportunity to tell us the how consulted just like many other organizations yes they were consulted and if you have the opportunity to participate in a framework i don't think you want the government to take everything you say certainly people have different views and so when you express your view and you have a superior view from somebody that is certainly what we will take for purposes of developing our country with the best ideas and so was consulted. We still want more ideas, especially the framework is a broad vision. The how will continue to discuss it. The minister has talked about some of the hows. There is no known technology as far as development of natural resources, hydrocarbon resources are concerned, that are not captured in this document. There is no known technology. And so, if you have any new technology, any new idea, we welcome you. Thank you very much. Uh, because of time, and we should be, you know, rounding up right now. So, please, because of time, I'd like to take two more questions. One first from Prof here in front. Please, the microphone. Yes. Oh, you have it. Yes. Please go ahead with your question. And the next person, I'm looking for a lady, if I get... I'm sorry, I denied the man. Is that a lady there? 
I'm sorry. Okay, so the men, you, the men have had a lot of him. voices. So. <laughs> All right. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. My name is Aposhi Adumakwampofu. I'm a teacher on this campus. Um, I haven't heard a social question, so I want to raise a question on social exclusion. Uh, perhaps Ben can help us. I haven't read the document, so I have to be careful. So I'm just asking for edification. In the conversations, in the consultations, have there been detailed, deep conversations with the communities? Because the social science research tells us that many of these communities, social development doesn't happen. It's the same with gold, it's been the same with bauxite. And in addition to that, we find deep social issues arising in many of our communities. You can talk about dangerous child work, you can talk about sex work, and all the other industries that come around um, you know, our oil and gas that are not necessarily beneficial to the people. And they see the wealth leaving their communities right you know, at their doorsteps. And poverty in those communities increases. And for me, that's um, extremely problematic. So I would like to hear from both our speaker and the discussant. Thank the, you very and, much. And the question specifically is that, please, let's give her the microphone. And the question to them specifically is the that... The question specifically is, what level of consultation has occurred with people in the communities where we are looking for these resources? Right. And what is being done to reduce the level of social exclusion? Thank you. Please, the next person behind you. Um, yes, the gentleman in black. You are not asking again? Okay, Thank you that will be our last question. Please forgive us. Time is far spent. My question, I'm Reverend Kinsley Amor. My question is, what we, are, we first of all need to commend the government. What that we is, what are some of the key policy interventions and, and initiatives that government will ensure the mainstreaming of this uh, strategy in the national development plan and so that we can actually its implementation we have seen a lot of policies but at the end of it all we don't see how they are actualized the policy framework should be mainstream in the national development policy agenda in all, all right. sectors so that we can ensure that by 2017 they are realized thank you very much thank you very much so um we have uh, mohammed aminat please Give the microphone to the Deputy Minister. He will respond to the questions. Uh, very important questions, uh, still on consultations. So we went to communities where mining activity is taking place, both for solid and, mi and uh, liquid uh, minerals. Farmers, um, fishermen, and then also assemblymen, traditional authority, women groups, youth groups. We provided that opportunity for direct engagement and they also had the opportunity to submit petitions and to uh, submit comments and write-ups to the ministry. So all this took place in the communities that you are talking about. But beyond those communities, we went to other communities where there is no mining, there is no oil activity. But the fact that the energy transition affects everything including communities that are suffering from vacation in the north, in the northern part of Ghana, in order for us to get a holistic view of how the country wants to move as far as it is concerned. But as the minister said, consultation doesn't end. And this is why maybe in this country we must define what we mean when we talk of consultation. And at what point can we say that consultations are exhaustive? We don't have that guidelines. We don't have that benchmark. And so if we were to say that until everybody has spoken on an issue before you bring out a policy, I don't think we will be running a country. I think the reasonable expectation is that yes. it should be extensive enough. The yeah. next question. In fact, this was, document the question, is the most consulted the question, document. The next question was is about mainstreaming of this strategy in the national development plan yeah this was important if you look at the national development plan it covers 
energy transition. So ministries will then have to take the various broad issues outlined in the National Development Plan to develop specific policies as well as implementation plans. And that's exactly what we are doing. So if you go to the National Development Plan, you will see a section focusing on energy transition. But the ministries are the implementing bodies and also have to now uh, distill that broad uh, policy or vision into specific and implementable policies. And that is what we have done on this. Thank you very much. Please, a round of applause for our guest and for yourself as well. Um, uh, ben, if you can indulge us 30 seconds of your concluding remarks. 30 seconds, please. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. I think this is not a uh, you know, battle that is exchanged by this. And as we indicated, that is what we do. Uh, really. It's not for our views to be accepted. Uh, but we shouldn't be seen to be taking the box when we're talking about consultations, engagements. It doesn't hurt to put out a document for people to look at a document before uh, it is actually published or finalized. It doesn't have to do that. And we have been in this policy space uh, and seen it happen time and again, where the government has shared for people to make on. Even though the initial uh, uh, data gathering was done in uh, uh, stakeholders, they still engage uh, with the draft government. The oil industry is struggling with uh, uh, consistent points year on year for three we need to talk that, but we are examining what is going on. Approvals are indicated as slow. Transparency has gone down. Um, you know, the Petroleum Commission Chief Executive indicates that things are published online, we can accept them. These are our are not updated. And when you even write to the Commission for updated information, they will tell you that they can't. It's proprietary information, even though the previous data is available. And Parliament has approved. Uh, a contract with work program that are stipulated in those contracts. Just to get an update, you right. didn't get. So I'm surprised that we will sit and say that the, the data is available when it's actually Right. The companies are not in the room. And maybe the next step will be to have another open conversation where people can be there to speak for themselves. The companies can be there to speak for themselves. Right. When you interact with them, what we hear is not what the government is saying. All right. I think but, that's really important for us to be able to attract the investment that we need. But we definitely this afternoon's um, program has forced or will force all of us to think about the energy transition that must be done. Ladies and gentlemen, please let us welcome back our chairman, Mr. Kweku Ando Awoche, for his remarks. Um, I think uh, those of us who are here, if we stayed longer, we'd be kept more awake with the back and forth. Huh? But uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate the university and the organizers. If you look around the room, we had a pretty full room, uh, good attendance, a topic of great interest, and I think the discussions that followed uh, demonstrated that. Um, well, we heard a lot of things today. I think uh, both the minister and uh, the CEO of the Petroleum Commission framed it quite well, uh, the CEO with his uh, PhD thesis of how long this country has been looking for oil, over 100 years. Um, and, and in fact, that's the same time, if not more, that the industrialized world has been using oil and gas to power their economy. So imagine the position we find ourselves where in an industry that is less than 20 years old, we are being told, well, it's time to switch. And uh, I think that's really the challenge that uh, countries like Ghana face. On the one hand, you could say that, well, our contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is very small, so we actually don't have very far to go. On the other hand, you could also say that we haven't done very much. So in that journey um, to net zero, even our small contribution, we have some way to go. The fact of the matter is that it's very clear that Africa is least affected, and Ghana is one of them, is, is the least contributor, but we're the most affected by climate change. So actually, it's very important for us to play our role, and it's, it's good to hear, and we were also introduced to the National Energy Transition Framework um, that 
lays out some of the issues uh, of how we get there. I thought there were two very important points that were made, maybe three. Um, the first has to do with the how, and the how is not just about speaking, it's about the incentives that are put in place, tax or otherwise, to encourage the kind of behaviors we want. We look to government for that. Um, then I thought uh, another point that was made that was very germane was how are you publicizing it, consulting, getting the people to know, mainstreaming. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate how important that is. And for me, the final point that I found very germane was how sustainable are these fine ideas? Because we all know that uh, after the next government comes in, we risk abandoning it or modifying it or doing something entirely different. And I think this is a challenge we face as a country. But I think overall we've had a good discussion. I want to thank the discussants, uh, the, the lecturer, uh, CEO, Egbert Fable, the minister, uh, Ben, and of course yourselves for the questions you raised. So thank you very much and well done.